this is going to be a relatively broad talk, kind of introducing some concepts as far as how we got here and thinking about antivirals. I don't think I can give a talk these days without at least acknowledging some of the vaccine aspects of things. And then I'm talking a little bit about some of the research work we've been doing. Um, that said, I'm happy to field whatever questions what, what the group wants to spend some more time thinking about too. So um, disclaimer is no financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I've been a site lead for the ACT clinical trials now since the, the summer. Lead. And um, the yard looks I'm terrible. on the OPPN. Yeah. And uh, we have some funding from the School of Medicine to do some particular respiratory samples and then process things with the blood stuff we've been doing. So just briefly to give some context of how we got here, I had heard um, through some of the um, infectious disease blogs about a new virus that was circulating late 2019. And then we coincidentally had our annual travel update by uh, Dr. Friedman on January 9th of last January. So that's when we first kind of dug into thinking about this. Um, at this time, there were about 60 cases, no deaths. And to be fair, like this is something that happens with some regularity. We've had bird flu flares um, over the past 20 years. This is our third coronavirus that we've had in the last um, couple of decades. So this is not a terribly novel concept. And I give lectures to high school students. And one of the things we talk about is laying out the next global pandemic and what it looks like and what the likely organisms are. So every time you hear someone say, there was no way to predict this, either I'm really, really smart, which I'm not, or this is something that we were kind of counting on at some level. Um, so when this first rolled out in January, it was still unclear if it was direct uh, human to human transmission or if it was all animal, but as we all know, that quickly developed. Thinking about COVID, in, in order to understand the disease presentation, you have to understand kind of how it all fits together. So upon exposure, there's a, a delay period before someone becomes symptomatic. That incubation period usually lasts less than um, 10 days and optimally about four to five days when most people start feeling symptomatic. Remember when we started, the initial recommendations were to wait 14 days after possible exposure. That's kind of a catch-all for most of our viral infections. Most um, are gonna manifest by that time. These are typical contagious organisms. What we've shown since then is that the vast majority, 98 plus percent will have symptom presentation by day 10 or so, which is why the CDC modified those recommendations down to 10 days after exposure. Um, onset of symptoms is amazingly typical of your normal viral infection. So, most common complaints usually start with sore throat, um, sometimes some GI complaints of stomach cramps or diarrhea, some fatigue, myalgias, and then cough. And oftentimes that shows up a bit later. Where things start getting, unfortunately, a little bit too interesting with COVID is that in about 40% of patients, they'll start having some cough that transitions into shortness of breath. And then for about 15% out of the 100% total, um, there's developed a dyspnea to the degree of feeling short of breath, having cough, and those are the people that we start spending time with in the hospital. Um, now, how long this lasts is really dependent upon the patient, their underlying health conditions, and the severity of their illness, and also some of the demographics and risk factors. Um, but most have self-limited disease, even in the setting of dyspnea, that lasts about a week. Um, but as we all know, that is not universally the case. So one of the other things that was quickly recognized with COVID is that there's a syndrome. And some of this is just your typical viral response, but then another, the second phase of illness was kind of mediated by a host inflammatory response. So the typical symptoms that we see early are these viral things. So malaise, fever, um, muscle aches. Uh, but there's a secondary process that really is what materializes in the lungs. And that is an inflammatory response that manifests in uh, lungs leading to hypoxia. This is mediated by the immune system, and it's a difficult balance because having a robust immune response is really, really important to clearing the virus, and yet having a kind of hyperinflammatory response that's centered in the lungs is problematic and can lead to hypoxia. And what's also interesting is that we have patients that will have prolonged episodes of fever and GI complaints, and then they'll actually start feeling better. And then only later they'll start having some cough. So it could be two weeks leading into the first signs of the dyspnea inflammatory response. Whereas others, we have um, patients come in with rapid onset of fever, cough within 24 hours, and they quickly proceed towards respiratory distress and failure in less than a handful of days. And so again, this is kind of how viruses work. It's atypical because you have the interplay between the virus, the inoculum and the host immune response such that it remains a bit unpredictable. If we could figure out how to identify everyone that comes into the hospital, 
um, and then identify those that are set up to proceed towards ICU requirement. That would be a huge development. It's one of the things that we've been working on. When this first start, we would have 10 people showing up on a ward in a given day, and all, all but certainly one or two of those would collapse in, into requiring high flow or innovation, but we couldn't tell who of the 10 would be the ones most likely to tip over. All right, so thinking more broadly about a virus, the purpose of any given virus is to expand itself through the viral life cycle and proliferate. So this includes transcription, translation, nucleic acid replication. So some form of viral suppression is usually inherent to how the virus works. And that influences how the immune response is able to receive or respond to the- It won't let me pick up today. Um, given the know. use of human host machinery in the viral replication process, it makes targeting the virus with uh, antivirals a little bit more complicated. Because if you shut down the viral host machinery, you're shutting down cellular function to a degree. And that can become pretty complicated. When we think about bacterial targets, we oftentimes focus on the cell wall because that's distinct from what we have for uh, human or eukaryotic cellular, cellular walls. And the other aspect of this is figuring out how the virus jumps from host to host. Um, if you recall, going back a year from now, there was discussion about wiping down your groceries, whether or not it's even safe to go out and get, get your mail, um, and then discriminating high-risk exposures versus low-risk exposures when in the company of others. And this, there was evidence of this very early on, but it's become far more uh, crystallized now of how the virus kind of transmits from person to person. So what we know is that it really is not truly an airborne um, infection, but it has, it's a very efficient in droplet form. And so it functions as almost a um, proxy for airborne, at least in um, limited uh, cases of high, high duration of exposure and persistent droplet. But where it's most efficient is in close contact with other humans that are infected and that are um, shedding virus in their upper respiratory tract and then aerosolizing that through speech or exertion. And while it's possible to inoculate yourself through contact, that really requires a high viral inoculum and a high risk exposure, which unless you're encountering droplets from someone sneezing, it's far, far, far more likely that this is from close contact in the presence of someone who's infected. Now, where this gets challenging now, if you look at this chart, is that here we have day five is the onset of symptoms. And so most people start feeling sick in that day to four or five, but that can wait to about day to eight to 10. But the peak viral load and coincidentally, the peak viral infectivity happens even before that onset of symptoms. So every time you go someplace and they're checking you for fever, you're already missing the point because about half, if not more, of all infections already occur before someone has their onset of symptoms. And that's why. COVID-19 has been so challenging as compared to other um, infections such as the flu. Flu, the viral peak usually occurs after the onset of fever of myalgias. So this is a huge, huge, huge challenge and this has been part of the struggle on the public health side of things. This um, figure is not new and we've actually had more data coming out to show that immunocompromised patients can um, persist in their viral positivity on testing but also their, were our ability to recover active virus. And, so that remains a challenge in some of those that are most at risk for atypical presentations. That said, for your normal walk and talk in human that has an intact immune system, it's all but impossible to recover live virus, at least from the respiratory tract within 10 days of um, symptom onset or even exposure. All right, so related to that is how we do the testing. So here you can see a bunch of different curves relating to um, which test or which kind of aspect you're looking for. So we can recover virus a lot longer in the lower respiratory tract than we can in the upper respiratory tract, at least in those that have severe disease. Um, the PCR test becomes positive sometimes even before someone becomes symptomatic just because of the surge and viral replication that occurs. Um, antigen is, comes a little bit later and goes away a little bit faster, um, but we've got much more nuance as far as our ability to kind of test these different aspects and get a better idea of kind of where people fit in their trajectory of infection. And related to this, going back to what a high-risk exposure entails is that being indoors for a sustained period of time for someone who may be early on in their infection is, is your most high-risk exposure. Whereas a area that is well ventilated, um, your, the inoculum present is far less uh, abundant. And so it's frankly rather difficult to get infected in outdoors unless you're really close to somebody. 
but yet in a restaurant setting where you have everyone that by definition, it doesn't have a mask on because they're eating, um, that's a much higher risk exposure. And that's kind of influenced uh, guidelines here over the past months that we've tried to slowly um, emerge from uh, the broad lockdowns. All right, so that's kind of an initial crash course in thinking about some of the uh, epidemiology and transmission kinetics of the virus. So the focus that I was gonna spend more time on is thinking about therapeutics. So to begin with, by definition, this is a new pathogen. There are no therapeutics ready and waiting to pull off the shelf that we knew worked for COVID. That said, we had a fair amount of preclinical research that had been done on SARS and MERS. So we had a little bit better starting point than we would for a de novo uh, virus. Remdesivir is one of these um, drugs that had been looked at for SARS and MERS. And while it wasn't specifically developed for COVID-19, was recognized as an early uh, drug candidate. And so even going back as early as January and February of last year, um, a couple of drugs that had already been approved for other aspects or had been in, uh, investigated for other infections were identified. And that's where remdesivir and chloroquine came out early as potential targets. So thinking about a successful antiviral therapeutic, you have to be specific to the actual virus. So people always talk about the cure for the common cold. Well, yeah, that's fine. But when you start thinking about what is the common cold, it's actually hundreds of different related viruses, including rhinovirus, but lots of other viruses that have very similar upper respiratory manifestations. So we can develop a therapeutic for one of those, but having a therapeutic that is broadly effective against upper respiratory infections is a whole different ballgame. So for a successful antiviral for COVID-19, it needs to be targeted to COVID-19. Next is that you need to have very timely therapy. So if you're going to interrupt viral application such that you ward off symptoms and progression, that means you need to deliver that drug early. Because if you wait for the kind of full inflammatory manifestations to already be present, the benefit of shutting down the virus is not nearly as much. And so you have to be able to leverage treatment early. Well, if you're going to start treating people very broadly, thinking about the 100% of infected and only 15% that have respiratory symptoms, you're really going to need to have a treatment that is relatively easy and well tolerated such that the toxicities of the treatment don't outweigh the benefits. Um, and that can be pretty tough. The best model for this is thinking about influenza, which is really the only other antiviral that we have kind of broadly in the setting of normal host immunity. So for that, you need early diagnosis and treatment such that our recommendations are generally, unless you have an atypical immune system that um, your exposure should be less than 72 hours or your symptom onset rather should be less than 72 hours. And then we would wanna treat as soon as possible our bond recognition of that. And then the last bit is that anytime you start throwing antivirals around, you risk the potential for developing viral resistance. And that remains an unknown for COVID-19. Last bit is that any, any knowledge that we're going to acquire in the setting of COVID-19 is gonna happen in a bona fide pandemic. And it is an understatement to say that everything is harder. So every single encounter, even potential encounter with a possible COVID infected uh, patient involves mitigating exposure for the participant, but also the study team. Um, this is still not resolved, but PPE is more stable supply chains now, but early on that was a huge issue. And so every single possible encounter need to be limited such that we weren't consuming excess PPE. Every single participant interaction is not only has to be keeping in mind the possibility of a contagious organism being present, but it's hard to have a legitimate conversation with someone when you're covered mask to toe with PPE, you have um, someone who's oftentimes hypoxic with either nasal cannula or high flow, and you have fans blowing in the room, and then we're going to walk through a 20 to 30 page protocol to try to explain what this trial is and how they might be able to participate. And then, oh, by the way, there's the collecting and processing of specimens with a highly infectious organism. So everything needs to be managed in the setting of a relatively unknown situation of how do we safely collect, process, store all of these samples that would be done. So in this setting, um, we, along with uh, about 70 other sites, embarked on a clinical trial based upon the ACT, or Adaptive Randomized Controlled Treatment Trial for COVID-19. This was um, housed in the NIAID, and UAB was identified as a potential site. Um, I'm going to walk through the timeline just to give some context of how this worked. But this trial is conceived as kind of a gold standard trial. So this is a randomized, placebo-controlled, blinded study. Again execute in the setting of a global pandemic. So to start thinking about how do we actually pull this off, we need to be able to check a few key boxes here. So who has COVID, which now this is relatively straightforward, but 
remember how difficult it was to get robust and accurate testing early. So this requires very accurate, very rapid testing. And then we have to be able to find those patients in the healthcare system. Consenting patients. Sounds easy enough, but again, we're dealing with a poorly defined infectious uh, organism. So do we do this on paper or maybe we do it on some electrical platform, but how do we bring that into the room and how do we clean it? And what about maybe doing verbal consent, but then how do we make sure that the verbal consent aligns with the IRB and then with the study at large? And then what about getting access to witnesses if we're gonna be doing verbal? Every single one of those steps has to be sorted out. The sample processing, who, where, when, storage, documentation, again, keeping track of all that. We have to provide the study product. And again, that involves uh, inpatient wards, ICU, the PPE associated with that. Every time we enter and exit a room, we're consuming PPE, so we have to be very thoughtful on that and then work with the pharmacist. Medical supervision of the study, that just means one more team that's going up on the wards that were already plenty chaotic. And then there's the data capture, the data entry, lots and lots and lots and lots of documentation such that when we complete this study, we actually have meaningful data. And then, oh, by the way, there's outpatient follow-up. Where are we going to send these patients? And how do we find those that are convalesced versus those that are potentially acutely ill? And then on the chart here on the right, it gives you kind of some scale of how quickly this developed, where in the beginning of March, we had no cases. And then rapidly by April, we were starting to see new cases every day. Um, and then the other pressure here was that when we had patients that were coming in in March into April, we could offer oxygen, we could offer some IV fluids if they were dehydrated, but we didn't have any other COVID therapeutics. And so there was a lot of pressure on the, the, the trial team to make sure that we were bringing people on a trial that could benefit, but also trying to deliver the trial to as many people that might benefit as possible. That was a tension that was difficult to balance. So for us, this timeline looked like on March 1st, 4th was the first time we were able to see the protocol. We had um, the campus went into the limited business model on the 15th. So staff all over campus were now working remotely. And that remains a challenge, but it was particularly a challenge at that time. We had our site initiation visit on the 24th and we received a letter opening for the study on the 25th. At that time, the study was about one quarter enrolled. We were, uh, our contract was such that we were looking for 12 enrollments to the ACT platform over two years. Um, I sent out an email to the team saying, looks like we have everything in place. We should be able to enroll two tomorrow and should have drug going by early midday. By the 26th, working through all the kinks, we had screened relatively intensively over 18 patients. We finally found one that met all the criteria, um, got all of the labs in place. The patient was on ECMO. Everything was more difficult than we anticipated, which is kind of the way trials work. And we got our first dose of drugs started in the evening. And that was just kind of representative of the roller coaster we signed up for. By April 19th, only about three weeks later, the whole study closed. We ended up enrolling 16 at UAB. And then by the 27th, one week later, when the data was starting to be worked through, again, we didn't even have, we hadn't even completed the study for those that were still involved. Um, the DSMB recommended unblinding due to the benefit of remdesivir. And then by May 1st, the first COVID specific emergency use authorization was in place for remdesivir. And as fast as that all went, it still was in a really intensive process. And our last patient that we enrolled on study didn't leave the hospital until November 23rd after enrolling in April that year. So we took care of some really, really sick people during that. This is the result of that initial study. So the way this looks is that you're looking at those that recovered. So every, every uh, increase on the y-axis is those that are recovering. The blue is representing those that receive study product or remdesivir. The red is those that receive placebo. You can see that this separates relatively early on and that is sustained throughout the primary endpoint in 29 days. And then on the right, you can see this table here across all the different demographics and populations and how consistent this was. Uh, and one of the subgroups in the mechanically ventilated subgroup, it wasn't clear because obviously um, remdesivir was crossing the um, threshold here on what benefit remdesivir provides in those that have more advanced presentations. This remains something that is in question and different institutions provide drug in a different way for this population. But you can see that even in all these subgroups, how consistent the signal was. Another way to look at this, these are those patients that were on supplemental oxygen or ordinal score five, which means they're requiring less than 15 liters of oxygen. And usually this is just nasal cannula, which typically is two to six liters. And for those that are receiving remdesivir, you can see that there's more blue and less red. Those that did not get remdesivir, you can see that there's an increased number of, um, these are people that expired and that you can see that those that recover to no oxygen requirement um, was few was less. And then these are some of the um, other non-primary outcomes that were identified. Remember this study was not powered or targeted for mortality. 
And so even though we met a mortality target for day 15, um, overall day 29 crossed the one threshold at 1.03. And so when we report this study, we say that there's not a defined mortality benefit with remdesivir, even though you can just see that just with a handful more um, uh, participants, it's likely that that uh, statistical measure would have been met, um, which is interesting when you keep in context some of the other studies and the way they're reported. So, Again, that study, the ACT study, was a placebo-controlled blinded um, study. Uh, but because science is complicated, there's another study that came out uh, later last year, which looked at a handful of regimens, including remdesivir, and found that there was absolutely positively no benefit of remdesivir, such that the relative risk was 0.95. Um, so how the heck does that make sense? And was one of us just clueless in executing the study? You can see how tightly these bars overlap. So this isn't something where it's separated and then kind of washed out. And so this is interesting to start thinking about, especially from an epidemiology side of things, is how does this data get generated? So the WHO study, solid error study, was not an inferior study, but it was a very different study. So this study was what is considered a pragmatic kind of format. So this is a no placebo or double binding study. Now, this provided the opportunity to enroll a lot of patients. Um, the numbers here, so there's 2,700 people that received remdesivir on this study. Whereas in the X study, the total study, was right around 1,000. So big, big, big numbers. But the way to get on that study was just to be diagnosed with COVID, and then you could be randomized to one treatment or the other. Now, this did not require diagnostic confirmation by PCR, and the timing was not clear. Um, the baseline physiological severity was not captured. And then the data support to go along with those that were enrolled is very, very different. So it doesn't capture the adverse events or the SAEs in anywhere near the same um, kind of uh, rigor. And then when you start thinking about the ACT report, which showed that there was a decreased time to recovery, that's um, five days overall with seven days shorter time in the sickest patients. And there's all these other supporting things that show this. And so really the takeaway here is that these are very different types of studies. And if you look at the data that they generate, they have different meanings. So for people that are diagnosed with COVID, that's on its own does not mean everyone should be getting remdesivir. But for those that are presenting relatively early, have relatively severe um, presentations such that they're requiring uh, oxygen support, those are the people that most benefit from Vesper. And that's how we kind of rolled out this uh, medication in, uh, in our institution. So to begin, actually every single person that um, was evaluated for remdesivir, my or one of my colleagues would um, review that course and then would authorize it. And then as we started hitting our second wave in November of fall, we kind of formalized a, a process that was automated. And this is actually now over a month old, but we've treated now over 1,500 people with remdesivir at uh, UAB alone. And when this study started back in March of 2020, about 500 people in the history of Earth had ever received remdesivir. So it, it's rather extraordinary how fast this all scaled up. Um, and then in October of last year, uh, remdesivir was the first FDA approved COVID specific treatment based upon primarily the work that was done on the ACT platform. All right, as I mentioned, there's two different phases of COVID. And so that's worth keeping in mind when we think about uh, therapeutics. So there's the antiviral strategy of trying to shut down viral application. But again, there's a pretty tight window for how you can do that because of the timing. But there's also the anti-inflammatory side and trying to target the immune response, which ends up being pathologic in its own way in more advanced disease. So there's a bunch of different therapeutics that were identified very early on and to think about the, how they may benefit. So. And just briefly, we, among many others, have explored this, looking at immune responses in acute COVID and how this looks. So this is a paper that was um, led by Dr. Files and our lab showing, uh, characterizing immune responses and um, lymphocyte activation um, profiles in acute COVID based on some of the samples we collected very early on. So one of the first reports that was really robust enough to kind of inform treatment strategies for anti-inflammatories was the recovery study. So what you can see here in this primary figure is that this was their standard of care. This was those receiving dexamethasone. This is mortality, which was their primary outcome. And you can see, again, these curves clearly separate. And so this led to the broad recommendation of those that have um, severe COVID disease should get dexamethasone. What's interesting and, and needs to be thought through and, and how we leverage this therapeutic is that on this chart, you can see those that received dexamethasone actually had increased mortality compared to those that did not receive dexamethasone and those that were not requiring oxygen. And then when we start digging into this, trying to understand what these numbers mean and don't mean is that the mortality rate for those that were requiring mechanical ventilation in this study were 41% at baseline. 
that's really high. Even when um, we were early on, excuse me, in the pandemic, I don't think our mortality rates ever got past 30%. And certainly not for the ACT platforms, we saw baseline mortality rate around 5%, whereas those receiving oxygen alone were having a mortality rate of 13%. So this all speaks to the fact that this is a very, very different cohort with a more severe disease. And then the other issue is that mechanical ventilation is here on this blurb, and you can see how effective dexamethasone was in mortality. But you can see that here in those that weren't mechanically ventilated, but also not requiring oxygen, the trend was significantly towards harm. And then you have this intermediate population, which is all to say that while dexamethasone clearly benefited overall in the study, it, there's some consideration for how best to leverage that medication in, across different subgroups. Um, while that study was uh, being published, we were enrolling for ACT phase two, which was looking at a different anti-inflammatory. And the construction of this trial is very similar to the ACT one phase, looking at remdesivir, and actually added the drug baricitinib onto remdesivir, and then compared that to a placebo group, which also included remdesivir. And so here you can see that the curve separate and showing that baricitinib, which is an anti-inflammatory that targets a JAK1-2 inhibitor, was uh, in improved uh, time to recovery as compared to remdesivir alone. And then here's kind of the raw numbers. And so thinking about these two different studies, um, ACT2, or the baricitinib study, remained randomized, placebo-controlled, and double-blinded. Whereas the um, recovery study looking at steroids um, was randomized, but not in a blinded fashion. And remdesivir wasn't standard care at that time. Um, ACT2 is pretty specific as far as defining those who did or didn't qualify, whereas recovery was this pragmatic uh, approach that allowed anyone that had a, a COVID diagnosis to be included. The mortality rates were very, very different within these groups. And it depends on your population for how you're gonna apply the, the um, interventions. And then what was found on the baricitinib study is that the largest benefits seemed to be in those that were on um, nasal cannula or high flow, whereas in recovery, those that were requiring medical, mechanical ventilation seemed to have the most uh, benefit. So this led to what is now ACT4, which is comparison of remdesivir and baricitinib versus remdesivir and dexamethasone. This study is actually about halfway enrolled now, but now that we're in the new phase of COVID, that's a problem because our numbers are such that it's going to be hard to actually fully enroll this study. Um, it's just one of these things that everything in COVID changes on a week to week, month to month basis. And so um, trying to adapt to the setting of having less uh, severe presentations is just its own challenge. It's all very good and was anticipated that this was going to happen at some point, but it's been interesting to watch how quickly it's changed. All right, one last bit here is that there have been a bunch of other immunomodulatory strategies tried. And tocilizumab, which is an IL 6 inhibitor, is a good demonstration of this. And this is actually included some of the other reports, and now I'm still on this slide behind all the reports that have come out. And there's been a really mixed picture of those that did and did not benefit from tocilizumab, and it's trying to align some of these more traditional blinded studies versus pragmatic studies. I think one of the primary takeaways is that given the broad inflammatory dysregulation that happens in COVID is that reflexively providing a single targeted therapy is likely not as beneficial as, as compared to something like steroids, which shuts down a bunch of different arms. I, and I think most of the people that have been involved in this literature really believe that tocilizumab or some of these targeted therapeutics may have a lot of benefit for specific patients, but we haven't really refined the criteria for identifying who are most likely to benefit from any given agent. Although hopefully as we dig into some of the data and samples that have been collected over the past year globally, we'll get a much better handle on that. All right, so as you can perhaps realize that it's really tough to sort through all these different developments that are happening the developments each are different. In fact, that we have all these um, pre-peer review publications that are coming out. We have different types of studies and how to sort out what makes the most sense for our patients that we're taking care of. And our approach for that has been uh, very early on, we formed a COVID therapeutic committee, which reviews this data essentially in real time and then provides updates as far as what we're recommending for our providers across the health system. So these summary data can be uh, reviewed on the UAB one side. This is um, what has been recommended across our institution based upon the data. And this updates the trials that we're enrolling, where the data is coming for these recommendations and how to best treat our patients. And this updates every time we meet, which fortunately now is only once a month, whereas we were meeting weekly to try to uh, accommodate all the data that was coming out. A complimentary thing that we've been doing is that trying to figure out that knowing that we had a lot of patients coming through the health system and knowing that we desperately needed more data was trying to figure out efficient uh, ways of getting people on a clinical trial that we're inclined to participate. 
So this is an effort I've been leading with um, uh, colleagues in pharmacy, rheumatology, ICU, hospitalists, um, with the support of our CRE group in Lee Kirkwood to routinely screen everyone that has a COVID diagnosis coming into UAB hospital, identifying which studies they may qualify for. And we uh, developed a, um, an allocation process to prioritize studies and align those with the, how they kind of fit into our overall treatment landscape. And this has been a very labor intensive process, but I think largely successful. Again, these numbers are a little bit out of date, but we've screened well over a thousand inpatients and we have about 200 people that we put on clinical trials here at UAB. A hundred of those have gone on to ACT. Um, and we have studies that have looked at anti-inflammatory treatments, uh, multi-platform ICU interventions, uh, among others. One other thing, which is what we were alluding to before the lecture formally started talking about the ROA is understanding the long-term sequelae of COVID-19. And this is very much a developing topic, but um, just briefly, this virus is a very messy virus. It targets ACE2, which is a receptor that is expressed very, very broadly. Um, and this is highly uh, present in the respiratory tract, but also can be found elsewhere. Part of the reason that we have such diverse and um, significant uh, long-term sequelae of COVID-19 is how the virus interacts with this receptor. We're just now getting a handle on the various syndromes that are related, and we still don't have a full handle as far as how frequent these um, syndromes are. And this is the purpose of the ROA that uh, a very broad and uh, uh, involved team has been working on these past couple of weeks. And just briefly to start highlighting the various places that this can show up is that there are the, the highest burden that we see is in pulmonary, which makes sense just because of the inflammatory and destructive inflammation that can happen uh, in the lungs during acute, particularly severe disease, but it's not limited to lungs. We have presentations of cardiac syndromes, skin syndromes, GI syndromes, uh, a lot of neurologic dis um, manifestations, typically just kind of persistent headaches, but this can end up being um, more Guillain-Barre or myalgias and a lot, a lot of fatigue, which is multifactorial. Um, this is something that we're trying to get a much better handle on. And, Fortunately, the NIH has identified this as a priority to, to think about going forward. Um, while all this has been going on, there's been a really, again, with COVID, everything has to be developed on the fly. This has been a pretty organized process from the start, knowing that samples were gonna be highly valuable in understanding what is and isn't happening with this uh, pandemic. So this is something that Drs. Gepford and I started even before we had our first case in Alabama, but rapidly turned into an institutional wide effort. And, to date, we have over two, well, around 200 or so convalescent participants that we identified early on, bringing back into clinic and collecting long-term samples on. Um, we have now enrolled over 2,000 hospitalized patients. We have, I think that number is actually about 900 sets of PBMCs from those patients. Um, and we have supplementing uh, that biorepository with hundreds of urine samples, hundreds of oral saline samples to be able to look at viral loads and uh, mucosal antibody. We have um, established an outpatient COVID research space that we um, will be seeing patients in perhaps as soon as this week. Um, we have hundreds of swabs that are uh, identifying and uh, available for high-risk patients. And this has been a pretty extraordinary effort with a lot, a lot of people involved. So uh, it's taken great participation from the clinical staff because again, we have to work around the PPE situation, the limited numbers of in entrances into patient rooms, and then also a team that has been responsive to what has been constantly moving uh, goalposts as far as what we are and are trying to accomplish every day. So not terribly interesting slides for um, the talk, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of this. So this is where these samples are coming from and the just sheer number of this. So this is the number of people we've enrolled so far is 2,500 people out of the 1,400 people, or excuse me, 14,000 people that came through UAB with um, COVID. And this is the sample breakdown. And this is actually, of those 2,500 enrolled people, this is all the different kind of groups that are represented here. So you can see the broad distribution in ages. And yes, it is heavily biased towards those that are older and more comorbid, but you can see the number of people. Again, the vast majority of these are hospitalized patients. So this is a lot of people that have come to the health system. Um, the gender breakdown, race breakdown, again, part of the uh, issue or benefit of being in the South is that we have access to populations that are particularly at risk for more severe presentations. So we have very good uh, representation um, from African-Americans. And then looking at who these patients are, and then also thinking about how this data had to be captured. So there's a really diverse 
an industrious team that have figured out ways to kind of be able to extract this data from these cohorts to be able to show those that ultimately required ECMO versus mechanical ventilation versus high flow oxygen versus nasal cannula, um, those that received different therapies across our healthcare system and the kind of comorbid morbidities that presented during their acute presentation. So there's just an abundance of data that ties back uh, from all the work that's been done over the past year. All right, I promised that we would at least briefly talk about vaccines. What's been fascinating about COVID is that their sequence was published in January of 2020. And by before the end of January, Moderna had access to that sequence as so beginning to synthesize the first mRNA vaccine constructs. So this has been an amazing accelerated process. Now, what's interesting though, is that that process hasn't been cutting corners to try to deliver a product. It's actually just flooded the system with money such that all the different steps could be uh, undertaken at once. So the early uh, vaccines have been driven by the mRNA platforms because of how quickly they can be scaled up. But now we have all these other products, specifically the AstraZeneca and Janssen that are now coming uh, available across the world. And there's a bunch of other vaccines that are in place to be available. And they'll all be necessary because while we now have a vac enough vaccine uh, promised for the United States, we don't shut down viral replication and transmission events across the world. We're just gonna end up with new strains. And so we need a really broad base of uh, vaccinations to be um, successful. So the mRNA platform is not a new technology, but it is a new vaccine just because it's never had the opportunity to kind of get to market at large. What's amazing about it is that it uses a mRNA, which is relatively easy to synthesize. It has its challenges as far as stability and um, cost, but the ability to kind of get this mRNA is pretty straightforward. And then it makes a perfect protein when you um, introduce it into the host. So you get this and that's always been the challenge is that to get a protein, we can identify what protein we want, but synthesizing it in a precise way is not anywhere near as straightforward. And that's really the, the magic of the mRNA platform. And so with the mRNA uh, vaccine, you get this mRNA delivered to usually muscle cells. The muscle cells then start spitting out these perfect little spike proteins of COVID. The immune system sees it, which is why your arm hurts like heck for the first day or two after your vaccine. And then um, you have this durable immune response to it. This bar graph is the bar graph that if there's any one thing that we remember from COVID, I think this will be it. This is the amount of uh, events or viral infections in those that receive placebo versus those that receive the mRNA vaccine. And it's just extraordinary how efficient, how fast this occurred. You know, when we are thinking about rolling out of vaccines, the timelines were dependent upon two things, which this chart kind of resolved. The first is that how effective is the vaccine going to be? And expectations were that a, a really successful first effort would be a 50 to 70% protection, probably skewing more towards the 50% protection side of things. And the other issue is that in order to see how effective the vaccine was going to be, we needed enough people on the placebo arm to become infected. And when the vaccine trials were being developed in early to mid 2020, it wasn't clear what that was going to look like. And unfortunately, fortunately, we had a confluence of events such that the vaccine products came on the market and we had just this massive upswing in the, towards the summer into the fall of 2020, which allowed this quick separation to determine how effective the vaccines were. So the fact that we had evidence of vaccine efficacy by early to mid November was a function of both of those things, just how extraordinary the vaccine products are and how much disease was present in the community at that time. And you can see just even after the first vaccine, kind of a projection of how effective it is. Um, this is the other very relevant table for that, which is the side effects. Um, these are different age groups, excuse me. This are the local events versus systemic events. And then this is the um, age group breakdown of those that were on um, looking at the product versus placebo. And what you can see is that this is a very immunogenic vaccine, so a lot of people experience some mild symptoms, either um, just some pain or some fever, but really very, very, very few severe or uh, grade four events, which I would hope that a lot of the people on this call now have had the opportunity to have that sore arm. Um, so again, a large number of people, some of this 50 to 75% of people have some um, reaction to the vaccine, but very few with them severe effects. Uh, that was the data for Pfizer. This is the data for Moderna. And again, they're very, very similar, uh, which makes sense because they're very, very similar products, just some slight variation in the, um, the sequence and the preparation. All right, so 
this is a brief acknowledgement slide because anything that I mentioned in this talk actually involves dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of people. Um, but these are some that um, I highlighted and I just want to make sure that everyone understands just how much work went into this. And I will go ahead and end it there.